Cell is hot. What's hot, <laughs> of course, is wherever I'm at. Hello. Mm. Um, but what's hot? No, is is I, I believe right now people are trying to find ways that they could leverage online. Everybody wants to make money online. Mm. People are starting to understand that, you know, the freedom process is incomplete until you're making money in your sleep. And so what's hot is what can you promote online that makes people attractive to what it is that you have? All right, guys, we got her out here in Vegas. We got Coach Stormy here today. Thanks for coming on. Hey, I'm so excited to be here. Just left Eric Warrior's spot, right? Yeah, just left. It was amazing. And you were telling me you've been with him for like years now. You've known him for like almost 10 years. I've been in the Eric Warrior's Vortex now since 2015. Okay. Yeah, 2015 is when I first started, you know, reading GoPro and learning about, you know, this guy who brings all the network marketers together. And so I've been listening to him since 2015. Mm. So he's a big part of your success? Yeah, I mean, Eric Warwick has taught me a lot of things that you just can't get from your company. So he helps me to stay informed on the changes, the future, current things to do. And what I love about him is he brings other network marketers together. So mm. it's kind of like case studies. So you get to really know what's happening in the field. Yeah, you can learn from each other. What's hot in network marketing right now? What's hot? Um, candy Clans, my products. The products I sell is hot. What's <laughs> hot? Of course, is wherever I'm at. Hello. Mm. Um, but what's hot? No, is is I, I believe right now people are trying to find ways that they could leverage online. Everybody wants to make money online. Mm. People are starting to understand that, you know, the freedom process is incomplete until you're making money in your sleep. And so what's hot is what can you promote online that makes people attractive to what it is that you have? Um, I find that, you know, when I think about what I do, I'm in weight loss. I don't know if you know that, but mm. I'm in I'm in the weight loss industry. So all things weight loss, all things energy, all things supplements, all things wellness. Yeah. So, you know, wherever I'm, wherever I'm at is where it's hot. That's needed, weight loss. Yeah. A lot of people overweight right now. You know, a lot of people on Ozempic and semi-glutide and Mongero and yep. um, a lot of that stuff. I, I, I get scared when I think about what's going to happen in 20 years when they talk about what it did to people. Yep. You know, I'm not trying to put anything negative out there, but knowing that that particular weight loss substance was really for diabetics and now people are using it for weight loss. Mm. It's just kind of scary to me. So I'm happy that I get to take more of the natural homeopathic approach so people don't have to have any future adverse reactions to my products. Absolutely. Speaking of 20 years, I was on your Instagram. You got a butt surgery 20 years ago. Yeah. And you just removed it? Well, you know, it was actually 25 years ago um, and I removed it actually a year and three days today. Mm. And what went into that decision? So first of all, when I was, let me, let me tell you the story. A lot of people don't know the story. And this is actually my first time talking about this. So I'm happy that you was uh, uh, courageous enough to ask me. Most Hell people yeah. are scared to ask me stuff. Okay. But um, so when I was 21, I was a stripper. Mm. And um, imagine going to work and, you know, everybody butt flat. And then the next day, everybody butts big. Mm. But your butt flat because you didn't know what was going on. And so long story short, you know, I went to work and I started losing money. Everybody was making money and I wasn't, you know, as... Um, I was a stripper to take care of my kids. I wasn't a stripper because I wanted to buy clothes and shoes. I was a stripper because I was a teenage mom. Mm. So I had to strip to pay for my kids' food, to put a roof over my head. So going to work and not making money wasn't going to work for me and my family. And so when I found out what was going on, I had to figure it out. And so I made a decision to do something that could have taken my life. Those butt shots could have taken my life. I have friends that died from those what? butt shots. Holy the person crap. that actually did my butt shots is a transsexual who's in prison right now Jeez. for the damage he did to people with those butt shots. And so, you know, over the years, my butt started to take on different sh a different shape. It didn't look good anymore. Mm. Um, and you could feel like the lumps and the discoloration. So it, it, it was good. I was good for like 12 years. And then all of a sudden it started to reverse. And so um, the decision that went in, the, that made me make the decision, I'm going to tell you the truth, Sean, I, I had insecurities. Mm. I don't want to keep anything that makes me insecure. And my butt made me very insecure. Wow. It wasn't no pain. It wasn't It wasn't hurting me. Um, as a matter of fact, I would go to the doctors. I went to several doctors that told me they wasn't going to touch it. They said, if it's not hurting you, then we're not, then we're not going to remove it. Mm. You know, I have a friend that, that literally the butt shots went from his butt and migrated down to his ankle. Holy crap. He literally had a, like a, a club foot like this big of an ankle compared to the normal size ankle and just... Literally within the last week, it took three years, three years for that suit, that sore to heal because they had to scrape it out and clean it Jeez. out. So that butt shot stuff is really, really dangerous. And so I just decided since I got the money, since I make money online, I could afford to step away. Mm. And I found the right doctor. I decided to go get it removed. And it was very dangerous, but 
I'm grateful that I survived and I'm here today to tell the story. Wow, I love that. A lot of women place a lot of importance on that area of their body. Yeah, they but feel I mean, a lot we got to be competitive. You know, yeah. men want... You know, flat, flat, flat stomachs, small waist, <laughs> and little butts, big yeah. butts. That's what the men want. So, unfortunately, a lot of times we don't care about the ramifications or the repercussions. We just want to be fine, and we do what we do. Right. They don't tell you about the side effects of it. No, and you know what? They do tell us. You just don't care. You're <laughs> like, I'm going to die trying to get fine. Yeah. Yeah. So, back then, that was important to you to look a certain way. Yeah, and I had to make money. If I didn't have no booty, I couldn't get no dances. Mm. And I couldn't get no dances. I couldn't make no money. If I can't make no money, I couldn't buy no food or pay the rent. Right. I was a stripper for a career. That's what I really did. It wasn't a hobby. It was how I took care of my son. Wow. I had my first child at 15. Damn. Yeah, I had my first child at 15. I ended up having to drop out of school in the 10th grade. I didn't graduate from high school. Holy crap. I have a, a 10th grade education. I went to high school two weeks of the 10th grade. And then I got pregnant. At 14 and gave birth at 15. I have mm. a 27-year-old son. Damn, that's my age. Yeah, you're, how old are you? I'm 27. Yeah, I have a son your age. That's crazy. I know, right? I look good. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So when you told your parents you're pregnant at 15, what happened? You won't believe it. So my mom, I, I hid my pregnancy from my mom until I was five months. Mm. When she found out that I was pregnant, she was trying to make me have an abortion wow. at five months. My mom was going to have an abortion with me. So she didn't think nothing was wrong with it. Mm. The only reason why I'm still here and, and my mom didn't make it to the abortion clinic at five months, same story, was because my dad, fate stepped in and my dad got into a big argument with, with my mom and she missed her doctor's appointment. Wow. And the doctor had told her, if you didn't come at 10 o'clock, I couldn't do it. She got there at 10, 15 to, to have an abortion with me. And so, you know, generational curse. My mom wanted me to have an abortion with my son at five months. And um, I remember crying, screaming. My stomach was big. She was like, I don't care. You're not bringing no baby in here. Mm. And my aunt called her from London and told her that she had a dream that I died having an abortion. And my aunt didn't even know that I was pregnant at the time. Whoa. So it was like, and so that's the only reason why I didn't have an abortion, because my aunt made that phone call and told my mom that. And then my mom told her, oh, my God, Stormy's pregnant. <sighs> yeah. So you that's, are here that's, for a reason. You know? Yep. You got a psychic in the family. Yep. Yep. That yep. is nuts. Yep. God stepped in. Yep. So you were doing the stripping, and then you went to TSA from there? Yeah, I did my research. Oh, my God. Most people don't know that. Yes, sir. Oh, my God. So, yeah. So living a life of stripping, scheming, scamming. I used to be a professional booster. Like, mm. I used to steal clothes and sell things for half price. Like, you know, I'm from Miami. So from Miami, we, we had buzzer bags, and we wore girdles, and we stole clothes and the girdles. I used to steal food from the grocery store, meat, chicken, mm. steak, wow. deodorant. <laughs> you know, I was a hustler. And my life just just it just changed when I made when I made certain decisions. Mm. And so um, I ended up becoming a TSA agent because everybody told me that I needed to get a job and having a government job was a good job. Mm. You had benefits. And I remember going through the whole process and wearing a big, ugly uniform and finally got the job. And I mean, I'm wearing these uniforms to work and I'm making 13, 25 an hour with benefits and I'm going to tell you the truth, Sean, that was the job that made me feel like a peasant. Wow. That was the job that made me feel like I was lowering my standards, that I was giving up on life. Um, because I used to see women come through the airport mm. looking real jazzy and real fly with their suitcases and they'll throw the bags on a conveyor belt. And I used to feel real stupid. And I was like, I'm too fly for this. And I wasn't fly. I was broke. I was a single mom. Uh, at that time, I had my daughter. Mm. I had my daughter at 19. And so I'm like, I feel like low level. I feel like worthless. Yeah. And so I, I like walked out of that job and never turned back. I didn't give a two weeks notice. I just left one day and was like, I'm not coming back to this. And it was after I had went to Atlanta. I went to Atlanta and I saw black success. Mm. You know, I'm from Miami. And in Miami, you know, either you sell drugs, you scheme, you scam, you strip, you have a boyfriend, you have a baby daddy. You're a football player. Mm. You're a rapper. You know, and so when I went to Atlanta... And I didn't have none of those skills, okay? So when I went to Atlanta and saw black people succeeding, in Miami it was only Latinos, mm. and Latinas, that, that was killing it, you know? And so when I went to Atlanta and I saw black people successful with Benzes and Bentleys, and I never seen that in Miami. I never saw a person that was legal driving around in big cars. Mm. 
And when I went to Atlanta and I saw that, and then I also saw friendly black people. <laughs> I wasn't used to that. I'm yeah. used to black people. They ready to fight. They ready to shoot you. They ready to do something to you. Mm. But in Atlanta, they was waving, hey, how you doing? How you doing? I moved into a, a community. They would come knock on the door and say hi. That was weird to me. I was like, you know, but that's where I learned the power of networking and meeting people and, and you know, the shortcuts to success as mentors and coaches. And so moving to Atlanta, on top of deciding I was not a peasant at that job at TSA was my breakthrough moment. Wow. Yeah. And also reading books, right? Oh, my God. I read Think and Grow Rich when I was 18. Mm. That was my first book that I read cover to cover. Actually, I read Think and Grow Rich, A Black Choice by Dennis Kimbrough and Napoleon Hill. So mm. I read the black version of it. Changed my entire life. Wow. You remember dropping out of school, especially if you were told and all you heard was, you got to graduate. You got to the white, the white fence, the white house and the picket fence. And, a, and so I thought that I was going to have to be a stripper or wait for somebody to take care of me because I didn't graduate. Mm. But thinking Girl Rich made me realize that I didn't have to graduate from high school to be successful. And that's when I learned the power of non-traditional education. Mm. And it's everything these days. I mean, you know, I'm not going to tell my son because I have a 10 year old son. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to tell him to drop out of school, but I am doing everything to expose him to non-traditional education while going to school, but I don't believe, I think that, you know, traditional education is setting you up to work for somebody. Right. And if that's what you want, then enjoy. But I believe that my family, the generational curses of working for somebody else stopped with me. And so my son is, is 10. He has to become, you know, a billionaire because I know I'm going to become one. So if mm. I'm going to become one and I broke that curse, he's going to create that new narrative of billionaires coming from my family. And I know it's not going to be from a traditional education. Right. It's hard to get rich working for someone else. I, I don't know nobody that got rich working for someone else. I think you work for someone else if you're learning from them, because I believe that you earn your way, you serve your way, you'll pay away. So yeah, if you're working for someone, you should be working for them with the intent to learn and either help them to build their empire or one day branch off and go build your own. Yeah. So if you work for someone, I hope it's because you're being a mentee. Absolutely. Speaking of your son, you're, you've been having some custody issues there with that one? So, yeah, so I have I have two sons. So my 27-year-old, of course, he's a man, but my 10-year-old son, you know, I have a very interesting story, and I don't I don't talk about it, you know. Mm. Um, and I don't talk about it because um, I don't want to make the situation uncomfortable for my son. Yeah. Um, I have his, his dad blocked, but his dad know too much about my life. <laughs> so I know he not blocked because he some way know how to find things out. Mm. And so I don't, you know, talk about it a lot. But you know, since you asked me, yes, my I, my son and 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 I are going through some some tough things. Um, my son, um, his father, his father. We were once married. We mm. got a divorce, and the the state of Florida um, is a family family law state, which basically means whoever makes the most money has to pay child support while that child is in the care of that other person or mm. that other parent, so to speak. And so, of course, I make more money than his father. And so right now, I can't do the things I would like to do. Like, I don't travel during the week. Mm -hmm. Like, my income, of course, was at a certain level, and it changed because I don't travel during the week. So I could only, like, work Friday, Saturday, and then I got to be back home Sunday. Mm. I'm used to being able to get up and work Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, fly here, fly there. But I don't want the, those travel trips uh, to affect my custody battle with what I'm dealing with with my son. Because wow. not only could I possibly, um, and I ain't going to say possibly, let me change that. What, what his father would like to happen is that we have a 50-50 custody split. And if that happens, I would have to pay child support. Mm. And that is the law. It's not no if, ands, or buts about it. The law would be whoever makes the most has to pay the other party. Got it. Period. At a, I, think it's a, I think it's based upon a 40, 40 to 60% threshold, something like that. But yeah. That's interesting. So I'm not, I'm not battling it. It's just a situation that's happening right now. Yeah. It's not affecting me emotionally or Financially, is just a part of what I got to deal with right now. Well, that's mature because a lot of people go through custody issues and it messes them up. You nah, know? uh, uh, no, I've seen it happen to too many people, and it's not going to happen to me mm. because I also think that's probably what his dad wants. Yeah, his dad want to see me be who I'm never going to be, which is who I was when I was with his dad. Mm. So I'm never going back to being that girl again. So you know, I'm not going to let it be a distraction. I'm just going to deal with it. But I'm, I'm happy that I'm talking about it today because women need to know that men prey on women these days. Men would have a child from you knowing that he could get child support from you. And a lot of women don't know, and this is not applicable ev in every state, but know the laws in your state. Mm. And, and even if you're broke, when you have that child, if you become successful after that child is born up until the age of 18, that woman can be eligible to pay the man child support. Wow. 
Yeah, see, I used to think that only men pay child support. No, and men are really going to court fighting for their rights because they want some monies. Mm. And, you know, women are doing big things these days. I'm proud of girls. Girls are stepping their game up, bossing up, you know, doing things that, you know, we normally wouldn't do. And yeah. so I, I know a lot of women, you need to be aware of what I just said, to be careful and to protect themselves from having children or dating the wrong men. Absolutely. You're one of the faces of that movement, for real. Yeah, thank you. You've been you. around for a while now. I'm 44, you know. Yeah. I know I look like a little girl, but I am <laughs> a grown woman. I am 44. That's Depending impressive. on when you watch this interview, because it's going to go viral. It's going to be around for another hundred years. But at this time, I'm 44. Legacy, right? Of course. That's what it's about. Yeah. So what are you uh, working on now? Because you've had a couple phases of your life now. Okay. Well, I am still actively building in network marketing. Um, I very much still love network marketing. I love what the industry is all about. So I'm still doing that. That's like my heart. That's my passion project. I'm also right now, I just launched a new company called The Digital Product Creators, where mm. I partnered with... Annetta Powell, she's another, you know, um, business serial entrepreneur that does a lot of yeah, different things. she's been on the show. She, oh, you met Annetta Powell? Yeah. So we just collaborated. Oh, small We have world. a company called Digital Product Creators. That's awesome. So we're going to help people to create their digital products and help them make money in their sleep. Mm. So we're putting all of the, the challenges, the back end, the logistics, the uh, back end to be able to see what your numbers are doing. Like we're putting everything together like a turnkey operation for someone who already has a knowledge, but they don't know how to make money from it online. Nice. So like I'm so excited about that, especially I made a product back in 2016 and I'm still making millions of dollars a year off of that product wow. right now. That's yeah. amazing. So, so passive income is real. What? Oh my God. So that um, also had my community girl hold my hand, you know, I am all for women and for men, but it's just a thing that I have for holding people's hands. You know, my mom died August 26, 2011, and I was holding her hand. Wow. And to been able to have held her hand up until her last breath um, to this day is everything to me. You know, mm. the first three and a half years, it caused me to go into a depression. Damn. But now it's like I feel powerful. Like, man, who wouldn't want somebody there with them when they're, when they're taking their last breath? And so I, I was able to have that opportunity. So I have a community that we meet every morning. I have a live community at 8 a.m., Monday through Friday. Women have a place, and men, because I have about 15 men now <laughs> in my community, a place to meet, to tap into their future, to get a message. So we do a message and meditation at 8 a.m. every morning. Mm. And so watching that community grow, watching people evolve, like I love transformation. Like I love seeing a person and by the time I see them, six months later, they're a whole new person. You can see the light came on. You can see that they've lost weight. They've transformed. So I get to do that in my community. So those are the three things that I'm very, very passionate about right now. And, and of course, I'm in health and wellness. So mm. I sell um, a product called Candy Cleanse, and it's a juice. You drink it, and in six to eight hours, it's going to cleanse you. Wow. And so um, I'm excited about what that is doing for people. And I just I lost nine pounds since I saw you. I lost nine what? pounds in six days. I saw you a week ago. I lost nine pounds in six days. From that cleanse? From the cleanse in a product called Resolution. So Damn. I'm just excited about transformation. Like, I, I don't know if you could tell. I look different from the day you seen me now. That's insane. I mean, you probably you got, wasn't paying attention. No, you got I a lot more jewelry on Nine pounds. <laughs> yeah. You know what? When I'm not in a place that I feel like I could do it, I don't wear all that jewelry all the time. It's like, that's that's a lot of jewelry. Yeah. It's not, I don't even feel comfortable when I wear all that jewelry. I feel that. Certain I feel like everybody's you. looking at me and they like, you could tell that that's not no cheap. Yeah. Know? So I don't like wearing it all the time. Certain cities you can't really wear it, right? No. Too much of a risk. Is Atlanta safe to wear it? Hell no. <laughs> I'm not wearing all my jewelry in Atlanta. It's you, not even worth it. You I don't there, even though. care. No, I live in Miami. Oh, you moved back? I, I moved back to Miami. Oh, okay. I, I mean, and again, I'm not being negative, but times are hard for people. And some people don't know what else to do. They're in survival mode. Mm. Why am I going to go outside with all that jewelry for what? No. When I'm going on stage and I know I'm going right in the building, right in the car... And I'm not, you know, like a place where you can't go through, like you got to be able to go through a lot of tape to get to me. Right. So when I'm speaking and stuff, it's like I wear my jewelry then. But if I know I'm going to, you know, be liable to walk into a restaurant or walk into a, a Walgreens, you know, I'm not wearing all that jewelry. It's not even that serious, Absolutely. you know? Absolutely. Yeah. You still smoking every day? Yeah, every day. <laughs> How you know? I smoke every day. I did my research. Day. I smoke every day. I, me I meditate every day. I pray every day. I speak affirmations every day. I move my body every day. I make money every day. I love every day. I command more for myself every day. There's a lot of things I do every day. Mm. The smoking one is interesting to me because you're one of the few I know that can pull that off. You know what? So you may think I'm crazy, right? But my parents are Jamaican. My mom is 
Jamaican. Mm-hmm. We buried my mom with a joint and a lighter. Like wow. my mom smoked every day. Um, my brother got shot in the head. I was nine years old. I never forget the day my brother got shot in the head. I was in the, in the shower, taking a shower. He jumped in the shower with me, and I looked up and I saw half his head gone. He got Holy. Sh- and he was 17 years old. Oh my God. Um, my brother, because of that, he um, suffered from seizures. They gave my brother a medication that had him like a zombie. My brother stopped doing that. Why? Because he smokes. So I've, I've seen the, med- the, the medicinal value of, of THC. So I'm not a person that's just all day smoking and, you know, like, you know, no. I, I let it take me where it need to take me and I stop. So I'm not a, I'm not a person that smokes and turns into a bum and I just want to munch and eat snacks all day. Like some people, it has that effect on them. Right, right. But for me, when I don't smoke, I don't really talk. I'm real quiet. Like I've been around big businessmen and women that know that I smoke. And when I'm quiet, like you want to, you want to, you need us to help you out, you know? Yeah. So it helps me with my creativity. And I believe in the plant. Mm. I believe in the, I believe in the, in the medicinal value behind the plant and what it can do if properly used. And Good you got to buy it from the right place. <laughs> Fox. Don't get Cause you got to be careful cause they're lacing it up with all kinds of stuff. So I only smoke OG booby black. Ooh. That's the strand I smoke. So Damn. I'm taking care of us. I, I got the rapper weed, you know? <sighs> You've seen some <laughs> growing up, huh? You know, I seen I, and I experienced. I was just telling my operation director in the car, like, I got to tell you some more of the things that I've experienced, you know, and um, seen and lived through. And I can't unsee what I've seen. Mm. You know, I've never had a psychiatrist. I never had a therapist. But I'm still thriving. I'm, I'm one of the top one percenters in the world in spite of what I've seen and what I experienced growing up. So, right. I mean, I don't, I don't look at it like as a, I'm a victim. I feel like I get stripes for what I've experienced, but who I am today mm. is even more special. You're good at co- compartmentalizing it, right? Putting it to the side. That's exactly what I call it. Decompartmentalizing yeah. my life. Yep. I mean, you've seen some major traumas. Most people that would eat them alive. Man, seen I've your seen, brother get shot in the head. Like I've that's... seen and lived through it. You know, I was in foster care from the age of about seven to nine, and in, in that foster care, I used to get like molestation attempts. Damn. And I say attempts because I figured out how to get those men off of me. And I want to share this story because I don't know who's going to watch this video. But when I was um, in foster care and at family and friends' houses and men would attempt to molest me, I would go berserk and crazy like I was having a bad dream Mm. and they'll leave me alone. So I never, ever got to that point. Thank God, because every attempt was when I was asleep. And so me losing control actually scared them off. And oh so I, I experienced a lot. And I've been fighting since I was seven years old. You know, me and my brother, uh, when my mom went to prison um, when I was uh, nine. Uh, no, seven, excuse me. I was seven. Mm-hmm. My brother had just gotten out of the hospital. He had suffered from third degree burns. And uh, my mom ended up having to go turn herself into the feds. And she left us to live with one of her best friends named Sharon. We love Sharon. Mm-hmm. We were so happy that, okay, mom was going to prison, but she was leaving us with Sharon. Well, my mom left Sharon like $1,200. Mm-hmm. Sharon was supposed to keep us for like six months. Long story short, about two months after my mom left us there, Sharon turned into like the devil. Mm. She started beating us with water hose. Whoa. She would feed us beets and celery. My brother wasn't even healed from his 30 degree burns. And she beat us, you know, as a kid. And I'm the one who called Child Protective Services at seven years old Jeez. to get my brother not out of that situation. So I didn't just see a lot of things. I experienced a lot of things, and I did a lot of things to save myself, even at seven years old. Mm, you had to grow up quick. I did. I did. You almost didn't have a childhood. You know what? I did not have a childhood. You wow. know, I'm not even gonna say almost. I don't know. You know, I don't know what childhood like eating dinner at the dinner table with the family. Like we didn't do that. Damn. No, only time I went to I went to church with my mom twice. One time for my godmother's funeral, and the second time for her funeral. I didn't grow up in an environment where morals and principles and, you know, chores and allowance and, hey, I signed my own field trip forms. Mm. I, I signed myself up into cheerleading and find money to and pay my own way into cheerleading. Yeah. I got my own school clothes, you know. I paid water bills when I was 13 years old. My first time in the strip club, I was 13 years old wow. because I needed to make money to pay the water bill back home at 13. <sighs> so, no, I did not. I did not have a childhood, but I'm not a victim. I appreciate it. I think wow. that's why I'm like so wise beyond my years. I'm only 44, but I know that I have a lot of wisdom because mm. I've been through so much. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Stripping at 13, man. 13. That is the youngest I've ever heard. Really? Yeah, 13. Mm. Really? What do you mean? That's so young. That is young. I thought you had to be 21. Yeah, but you, you know, I figured you out. You got to get, fake, didn't you? I, <laughs> so silly. No, faith didn't get me in there. Fake ID did. 
Yeah, <laughs> I feel that. Faith ain't gave me the strip club. A fake ID did. Yeah, I had a fake ID, and I always carry myself like a lady. Mm. So I was able to, you know, finesse my way in in a club. But I'm, you know what? When I think back, I look like a little girl, but they they probably didn't care. Mm. They want as long as you pay, you got to pay to dance. When you when you, it's called a tip out of bar fee. You got to pay like a hundred bucks, hundred and forty bucks. If you produce an ID and you pay the one forty, they not tripping. Mm. DJ fee, you got to pay. So it's a business. Wow, money was good. Yeah, listen, I've had five thousand dollar nights, ten thousand dollar nights. Yeah, that yeah. is a lot of back then too. This is oh, like yeah. twenty years ago, right? Thirty oh, years ago. I'm forty four, and I stopped dancing when I was like. 20. Okay. So 24 years ago. No, yeah, 24 years ago. Damn, so you did it for seven years. I, I, yep, I danced consistently for like three years. Okay. But from 13, I just, you know, dibbled and dabbled inside to get some money to go buy some milk or buy some clothes or buy some shoes for my son or something. Mm. But consistently from like the age of like 17 to 19, yep. And how did you stumble across network marketing from there? So when I moved to Atlanta... And um, I was doing real estate. I don't know if you, you researched that, but I did real estate. I didn't get a real estate license back then. I have one now. Mm -hmm. But I used to help people find homes in Atlanta. And I would pair them with a, a broker or a realtor. And the realtor or the broker would give me 50% of their commission. And so when I got to uh, Atlanta, that's where everything like started. Mm. Got it. So you met some people out there. They kind of put you on? So... <laughs> The story is so deep, and every time I think about it, I almost get emotional. So I moved to Atlanta with $135 worth of nickels, quarters, and dime to my name. Wow. So I took a jar full of change, and I moved to Atlanta. And uh, when I got there, at first I was living with a friend, and I was sleeping on her floor. I was, you know, figuring things out. And then that's when I started to do the real estate thing. And when I did the real estate thing, I ended up making enough money to get my own house. Mm. So I ended up getting a house, but I bought a house with, with no neighbors, but I moved into this house. And after about maybe about a year, a year of being successful in real estate, the market crashed. So mm. I was in, in real estate. You was a kid. This was back in 19. No, no, no. This was back in 2005. I don't know how old you were in 2005. First grade. <laughs> oh, my God. Are you serious? Yeah. Are you serious? Yeah. So in 2005, Real estate crash. This was when you could get a house with a 500 credit score. Okay. No docs. Can you imagine? No docs. 500 credit score, they'll give you a house. And so, long story short, I, I got like three houses and the market crashed. And when it crashed, I was left again. I went from making 20000 a month and I was left again broke. Mm. And I had three mortgages to pay. I had my kids. I had my mom that um, was, in, was in prison. I only had two kids at the time. And i never forget. So, I was... Renting out my house because I said, okay, Stormy, you can't pay the mortgage. You you you, you got to get out. At this point, I filed bankruptcy because my mom taught me at a young age how to file bankruptcy. Mm. So I filed bankruptcy and I said, you know what? When you file bankruptcy, you don't have to pay bills for like years. Just keep filing. So I don't know. I, I'm not trying to give y'all no, no, <laughs> no training classes here. But you keep filing and you literally could live like but not paying no mortgage and, and no car note for like years. Mm. And so I said, but if I could just rent this house out. I could use that money to pay my rent because mm. I didn't have a job at the time. So I ended up calling this gentleman who I, I knew did, did did like, you know, um, renovations and all that because I said, okay, if I'm going to rent this house out, if I fix this room in the bottom, I could rent it out as a 6-4 because it was uh, the capacity to put two bedrooms downstairs. Yeah. And so I said, if I get this guy to come over, he renovates the house, I could rent it out, I could collect more money. Mind you, I didn't pay the mortgage. I was going to take the money. Mm. Long story short, I end up meeting this gentleman who said, I definitely will rent this house if you complete the basement. So I got on. He said, I'll actually give you 10000 more than you're asking for right now because I need this place right in this area because the studio was nearby. He was in the music industry. So I called this guy to do the renovations. And when a guy comes over... I didn't know the guy was going to prospect me. I'm thinking he's going to come, he's going to give me a quote, and I'm going to get the basement done. Yeah. But as he was measuring everything, he looks down at me. He said, do you or anybody you know want to lose five pounds in five days without huh. diet, exercise, surgery, or pills? And so I looked at him. I'm like, you trying to call me fat? And he's like, no, 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 my wife. And I didn't know he was married because he was flirting. So I didn't know he was married. Huh. He goes, my wife. No, 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 no. My wife just had a baby, and she looks better now after the baby than even before. Mm. And you remind me of her. And I would love to introduce you to her. And in my mind, I'm like, ooh, somebody fine after a baby. I just was nosy. And this, 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 is, this is important that I, I get this out because somebody's going to watch this and they're going to know 
that as a business person or a business network marketer, businessman, when you are trying to collaborate or bring somebody to someone, learn how to edify. Mm. Learn how to tell a story that gives value to that person. Because he sold me on the beauty of his wife. And he actually called his wife and, and was like, I'm meeting with this woman named Stormy Wellington. I'm doing her basement. She wanted to meet you. And the wife was like, oh, my God, I'm having a meeting tomorrow. Mm. Do you want to come? Of course I, I wanted to come. I wanted to see if she was as fine as he described her to be. Yeah. I went to that meeting. I brought two of my friends with me. She was presenting in front of the room, and she was gorgeous, Sean. She had long hair. She had a small waist. She had the nice butt, everything. Her legs was everything. Mm. And she just looked like success. And my friends was pinching me, and they was like, this is a scam. We need to leave. And I was like, what if she's telling the truth? She pulled up in a BMW. It felt right. And that day, this was 2005. Mm -hmm. I went to the meeting. I got in network marketing. I wrote a bad check. My two friends told me I was stupid. That was the greatest mistake I've ever made. We actually fell out. But I ended up making a million dollars in that company in one year. And I was broke when I first went to that meeting. Wow. Yep. And that's yep. all mindset. All mindset. But see, I had read the books. And I had already gotten to a place that I said, okay, I got to make a change. And I realized that I kept making the same mistakes. Like, I keep finding these little hustles, getting these little jobs. Something has to change. And I never forget, you know, reading that, you know, coaches and mentors are the shortcuts to success. Mm. And so I said, okay, maybe she could be my coach and I'll learn how to do what she's doing. If I may not be able to make 60000 a month, but if I can make 6000 a month, that's life-changing income. So right. I literally joined back then just to make an extra five hundred to a thousand dollars, and here I am. I've been in the game almost sixteen years. Crazy. Do you feel like a lot of people's mindset is kind of closed off to this sort of stuff? Absolutely. I think a lot of people's mindset is closed off to a lot of things, but I think very closed off even to what I do because we hear network marketing, we think pyramid, we think scam. It's because that's what our forefathers told us. We don't know what they were talking about. So mm. we're just repeating what we heard or what we've seen everybody else say or we heard everybody else say. So. That's why I love to to do interviews like this. I love to talk about the industry because if I would have learned about network marketing prior to being a stealer, a shoplifter, a booster, a scammer, yeah. I would have gotten network marketing. I've always been a hustler. Mm. Like I who wanted I didn't want to be a, a shoplifter. I didn't want to scam. I didn't want to steal. I didn't want to strip. I didn't want to do those things, but I didn't know about network marketing. Mm. Nobody told me about network marketing. So I wish that we stopped repeating things that we're not sure about right because you don't know who else you're discouraging from anything yeah there's so. some haters on that industry for sure on social yeah, media and I, and I think it's just i wouldn't even call it a hater i think they just don't know no better that's mm. why we need to you know go get some new knowledge and, and put ourselves in environments to learn new things because a lot of the things we're repeating is because our parents did it i would never want to walk in the shoes of my mom my mom spent years of her life in prison mm. so yeah i feel that if you like the product i mean i don't see an issue with it like if you actually like the product you're promoting? Yeah, I think that you you shouldn't promote the product. I mean, you shouldn't do the business if you don't like the product. Right. I would not do the business if I didn't like the product. I would use my product for the rest of my life, so I might as well sell it. Yeah, there's alignment there. Yeah, Absolutely. you can actually get behind it. People yeah. can see through the fake stuff these days. Yeah, I mean, and then everything is about consistency too, right? So if you can't consistently be on whatever you're selling, whether it's a product or a service, how you expect somebody else to consistently do what you're not willing mm. to do. Everything is principle-based. Facts. So your mom spent her last years in prison? You know what? Pretty much. My mom went to prison at 57. She walked in at 57. She rolled out at 59. She passed away at 61. Wow. Did yep. you see a lot of regret from her? Absolutely. Oh, my God. My mom was depressed because of it. Mm. Like, she aged very bad. At 60, she, she looked 70. She couldn't hardly walk. Mm. You know, she spent her whole life as a drug dealer because that's all she was exposed to. You know, I I love, I still love my mom. She's my hero to this day. Mm. You know, I honor her with my life. But the truth is my mom wasn't exposed to a lot of things. All she knew um, was drugs. And I just found out, Sean, like about a year ago, her mom is who started her selling drugs. Wow. Her mom is who started her selling weed. Crazy. And weed went to... Everything crack and everything else. So my mom was in the game, game, game. So I saw a lot of regret. I saw a lot of regret. She wore regret on her face. My mom cried so much, she burst her tear ducts. She had Damn. no tear ducts. So my mom had like tear ducts hanging over her eyes. What? So she cried that much. So yeah, she she 
She, I, I tell people, my mom died of a broken heart. I wow. believe she died of a broken heart. That's mm-hmm. sad, man. Yeah, because that was before the internet, so you really didn't have exposure to making money in different ways. I mean, ways. You, you had Jim Rome and Zig Ziglar teaching you things, but if you didn't know nothing about the internet and or, or what a mentor, like my mom didn't talk, talk about mentors and coaches. That wasn't a, a thing. <laughs> What is a mentor? You know, we, we was taught to idolize somebody. Who do you idolize? Who do you who do you want to be like? Right. You know, who's your role model? We didn't hear mentors and coaches in my era, you know, and I'm 44. So my mom definitely, if I heard role model and idolize who you want to be like, now you hear coach and mentor a lot. You know, people mm-hmm. are thinking and feeling like, okay, that's acceptable. That's needed. But my mom didn't know about that. All she knew was I didn't want to work a job. I don't have an education. How could I get some money to mm-hmm. live a, a free life? I'm going to sell these drugs. And she was a good drug dealer. She did a great job. She just didn't learn the other skills so she could, you know, convert from being a drug dealer to doing legal things like I did. I converted from the street life, the scamming life. You can't get me to do nothing illegal. I'm yeah. talking about I don't care if I can make a million dollars in a minute. If it's illegal, I'm not interested. I'm not touching it. I'm asking all the questions. Tell me about it. Who did it? <laughs> now, how is this right? Is this right? Like, I don't do nothing illegal. I'm not going to jail. I'm too cute to go to jail. <laughs> It's not worth it these days. No, I'm not doing nothing illegal. Yeah, scamming's not worth it anymore. Mm -mm. I mean, a lot of people actually start off drug dealing that are entrepreneurs, though. Really? You can learn a lot from drug dealing. Yeah, they got to run organization. They got to keep, you know, track of the business. They got to watch their back. They got to stay protected. They got to keep the money. They got to flip it. I was a little weed dealer. What? Yeah. (laughs) I would never think that. Yeah, in college. What? Yep. How you got into that? Because I needed liquor money. Needed party money. Needed food money. So I sold some weed. How did you stop? Um, had a terrible panic attack, honestly, and I was high. So I just stopped smoking after that. Wow, congratulations. Yeah. Xanax me up. Wow. And see, I never see I'd never taken like those type of things, like ecstasy pills, Molly's wow. Percocet. You never did a hard drug? Never. That's impressive. Never. From your like how you grew up and how no, you were raised. No, I'm listen, I have an addictive nature and I could afford it. So imagine I take a drug and I like it. Mm. I could buy it. That may be the beginning to my demise. So I won't even try it because I don't want to like the feeling. Dang. Yeah, you probably so, had friends that you saw go down that road. Oh, hole. my God. I had friends that was addicted to Xanax and they fallen asleep at the table. I've seen people, you know, addicted to Percocets and they couldn't get off of it. And beautiful souls, beautiful people. And mm. it took a lot of they, they, their years from them. So I don't think that's a joke. I think that addiction is serious. Yeah. You know, I just I don't want to get addicted because I have an addictive nature. And what if I try it and I like it? Like, listen, I've had people try to offer me Adderall. Mm. And they were like, girl, it's going to get you. You're going to get the job done. You're going to work. Oh, my <laughs> God. They be selling me. Oh, my God. You're going to do. And then when they, they talk too good about it, I'm like, don't worry about it. Because where am I going to get it from? <laughs> I like this Adderall. I like how it makes me focus today. Where am I going to get more from? Mm. I don't want to be a fiend for nothing. That I got to try to find somebody to give me something. I love that. I don't want to be a fiend. Yeah. So I'm just afraid of hard drugs. You just talked in front of a few thousand people in Salt Lake. What's your main message when you're on stage? Oh, my God. My main message, I would have to say, is that two things. I would say one is be, be careful of the story that you tell yourself. Mm. You know, be careful. You know, I, I write these books to myself. I wrote this book in 2023 called New Rules. I was in this relationship, and I couldn't seem to get out of this relationship. And I'm like, what is wrong with me? Like, I couldn't shake this relationship. And I woke up one day and I was like, okay, I'm going to give myself a set of new rules. And so that, that book, I wrote it in 2023, and it was according to what I needed to do to shake that addiction. 2024, I wrote a new one. It's mm. 2024 new rules. I'm going to be releasing it soon. And the very first new rule of 2024 is, what if your thoughts are wrong? Mm. When is the last time you questioned your own thoughts? And I'm not talking about it in a negative way. I'm talking about you making, you know, I got a good friend, right? She makes two to three million dollars per tax season, wow. right? Something happened. She's no longer in the tax game. She was depressed. She was sad. She was hurt. She was like, oh, my God, I've been doing taxes for like 15 years, 12 mm-hmm. years. And she went through something. She can't do taxes no more. It took her about two days to figure it out. She went from I'm sad. I'm depressed. What am I going to do? I can't believe this is happening to me. I'm, I'm about to get rid of one of my Rolls Royces. Two days later, she launched a whole new company mm. teaching people how to, you know, make digital products. And now she's saying, listen to what she's saying. I can't believe I almost settled for that Social Security check of 2 to $3 million a year. Now I'm about to make 2 to $3 million a day. Damn. So my question is, 
What if you think what you're doing is the bomb? You think you're doing something, but you're not doing nothing. You're supposed to go from a hundred thousand a year to a hundred thousand a day. Yeah. So I just think that people should challenge their selves. And so my message is the story that you tell yourself, you know, challenge, challenge yourself and your, your tongue has power. Mm. You know, like I believe wholeheartedly in talking to myself. Um, I believe that, you know, you got to understand how you start and how you have to finish. And so I just have a message, I believe, of inspiration, but also transformation. Absolutely. How tough has dating been since you came into wealth? Has it been a lot harder? So it was um, until I discovered who I am and what I wanted. So, you know, you know, sometimes I wake up and I'm like, wow, am I really Stormy Wellington? <laughs> and, and I said it in the most humblest way, but I say that it's like, you got to know, sometimes I don't know I'm me. So the Rolls Royce is not a big deal. The yacht is not a big deal. My, my mansion is not a big deal. My jewelry is not a big deal to me. But I got to be careful with that because it could attract the wrong type of people. Right. You could think that it's nothing to you. Oh, but it's everything to them. Oh, they only want to be around you because of these things. Mm. So in terms of me in the past, not knowing my value, not knowing that, those type of things attract the wrong kind of people if you're not present and aware. Um, it was hard. Mm. It was hard. And I'm I'm a I naturally am a nurturer. Like I'm a I'm a pit bull in a skirt, right? Mm. But I am a lover. Like I wanna love you. Everybody's a project. I wanna transform you. <laughs> and I, I see the best in you and and I'm gonna help you. And and even though you may not have it, I'm gonna help you, you're gonna get it. So I, I realized that I don't want that no more though. I, I realized that that's not good for me. Mm. I, I realized that when I d date like that, I was in my masculine because I was being the man. I was the one that was controlling everything, and this is what we're gonna do and that. So when I realized that that's 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 not the type of man I want. Yeah. Now my dating, I'm with one guy. I've been with him for a little over a year. Nice. I believe he is like my soulmate. Wow. Yeah, he is like my twin flame. We are so much alike. But it was after I realized that I got to stop doing that. That's not what I want or what I need. I wrote a list of what I wanted mm -hmm. and what I needed in a man. And I honestly tell you, uh, Sean, once I put that list out there and I set my I set my intentions on it, he came in like like five months after my last breakup. Amazing. So manifested and I, it. I manifested. I created the environment to manifest it. And I think everybody has a capacity to do that. So yeah. now I'm just so happy. I'm so peaceful. I feel at home with him. That's so, great. Yeah, it used to be hard, but not anymore. I've heard rich women struggle dating, actually. But it, you know what? I believe now, and the women going to get mad about this, it's, <laughs> our, it's our fault. Mm. It's our fault. Really? Yeah. yeah, yeah we, <laughs> we have to know what we want, and we have to know ourselves, and we have to also know what we need. And we also have to know that we play a role in bringing the, the good or the bad out of a man. We can make that man his best, or we can make that man his worst. Mm. And a lot of times, women don't take accountability for who we turn men into as well. Wow. So I've learned that's why I can't date a man that doesn't have certain qualities, and I would never do it again, because I have the tendency to demasculate a man. I would. <laughs> and I would do it like kind of like on purpose, for real. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I realized that about myself. Interesting. So what would you do that would make them feel that way? Um... Uh, a lot of things. So, for example, going out to eat with a woman mm -hmm. and that woman always paying the bill. Mm. A real man should not be comfortable with that. Not all the time. Yeah. Every now and then. But how manly do you feel if after every meal your woman is paying? Facts. I'm going to do it and I'm going to let you let me. And then I'm going to disrespect you and I'm going to talk to you less than. If, and then you go to the valet and then out. And when it's time to pay the valet, the woman is going to pay. That is crushing that man. Mm. No real man is going to feel like a man if every time it's time for something to get paid, his woman is paying it. He like a little puppy. Right. Right. Or, I mean, I could demasculate a man just by going to the mall. Mm. I could go to the mall and spend $20,000 in five minutes, which I've had, and the man just standing there and he can't afford it. And he looking at me and he's like, you know, that's demasculating. No man wants to be with a woman that could do what she want when she want with whoever she want, and he's just there on the side. Yeah. Um, I'll give you another one. I, I'll demasculate a man. Like, you ain't going to take out the garbage, I'll take out the garbage. <sighs> That's weird. Women do those type of things. What? Yes, women do those type of things. Do, I, you, you don't want to pump the gas, I'll pump the gas. And then a woman will stay with that man. Or, <sighs> or, or, or 
or or you don't you don't you don't text me back, I'm gonna keep texting you. Women do those type of things. Or you don't you don't answer the phone, I'm gonna blow your phone up. Mm. Like those type of things to me are is not feminine energy. It is demasculating to a man, talking disrespectfully to a man. Like I've I've called a man out his name before. Like a woman should not talk to men any kind of way. So when I look back at who I used to be, I realize that I'm not good for a man that's not confident in who he is. I'm not good for a man that is not assertive and aware and it's not about money. I can make more money than you and you still can be confident in who you are as a man. Yeah. It's all about your mindset and how you feel about yourself. Interesting. So a lot of successful women demasculate men. That's why you have to be careful of not dating a man that's not on your level because mm. you can make him feel worse about himself just by having him in your presence. I could see that. Of course. And a lot of guys say they could date women that make more than them, but I think it's easier said than done. It hurts their ego. Yeah. And I mean, no man should want a woman that's taking care of them. That's not a man. That's not That's not good. I mean, if you're sick or something happened to you, absolutely, let me take care of you, baby. But no man should be with a woman and, and he can't go get his hair cut until a woman give him some money. He can't, you know, go buy no outfit until a woman give him some money. He can't do nothing special until he's doing it with his woman. Like, no man feels like a man in that kind of relationship. It's not yeah. possible. Yeah, that's embarrassing for sure. Stormy, <laughs> it's been fun. We yes. went all over, but uh, anything else you got you want to promote or close off with? Any coaching you offer? You know, I'm really excited about just exposing people to a new way of thinking. Um, I'll tell you that I believe that uh, 80% of success is spiritual. Mm. I believe that a lot of times we put a lot of success on the mechanics, you know, the blueprints and all those type things. I became the woman I am today from the pink print. I have a soft, compassionate, loving approach to life. And I could tell you over the last nine years as a network marketer, I've made over $51, 51, 51 <laughs> million dollars. Wow. Um, but that's not the most amazing part. To me, the most amazing part is that I've coached 139 families in my career to seven figures, to mm -hmm. multiple seven figures. And now I believe that this is the perfect time for people to get involved in entrepreneurship, but more importantly, online entrepreneurship. I mean, don't take it the wrong way, but you could become a whole new person on the internet. Mm. Like forget your old life, who you used to be, what you used to do and recreate and reinvent yourself and live a whole new life on the internet and attach it to a product or a service and believe that it is the perfect time for you to get wealth. And 90 days, six months, a year from now, your life could be totally unrecognizable. Get a coach, get a mentor, get connected, get plugged in and believe that you could be, do or have anything. And that is my message. I want people to believe and the power of their own potential. Stop putting their potential on their kids or their husband or their wife or their boss. No, step up and do what's necessary because now is the time for us to get wealth and to break generational curses. Bars, love it. We'll link your stuff below. Thanks so much for coming on. Follow me on Instagram at Coach Stormy with a Y. Okay, let's continue this journey in this relationship because it just began. Boom, we'll link below, guys. Thanks for watching. See you tomorrow.